All right, thank you very much, Raj. I appreciate um, the invitation. Um, I'm sorry that I was unable to visit uh, in person back in the spring, um, but I think this is the new normal, at least for the, the, the next probably six months, I would imagine. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I, I, uh, I'm gonna spend most of my time today talking about membrane materials, which is really the area that my group has focused on the most in the last, I would say five years or so. <clears throat> Um, and so title of the talk, Nanocomposite Membranes for High Flux and High Selectivity Membranes, was kind of deliberately vague. Most of what I'm going to talk about today has to do with desalination, although I think some of the concepts that we're, we're interested in exploring um, have applications in other kinds of separations, whether it's for organic solvent filtration and, and separations, or whether it's for gas phase uh, separations. Um, and so we'll start, let me see, we'll start just by giving the... Uh, the, the advertisement about Virginia Tech. So for those of you who don't know, Virginia Tech um, is the uh, land grant state university in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We're located in, in Blacksburg, Virginia, uh, which is a true college town. We have a population of about 40,000 uh, full-time residents and the student population at the university grad and, un and undergrad is about 30,000 or just over 30,000 students. So um, we, we really are, uh, a college town. In terms of where we are, we're located in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, so we're about an hour from Roanoke, which is the, the big metropolis in the area, which most of you have, have probably never heard of. Uh, we're about four hours from Washington, D.C., about two and a half to three hours from Charlotte, and about three and a half hours from, from the Raleigh-Durham area. So um, we're, we're, we're a nice place to live as long as you don't want to spend a lot of time in the big city, which is, is convenient for me. Um, this last weekend, my son uh, is, a, is a, a sixth grader. He just started Boy Scouts. And so we spent uh, the weekend up on the Appalachian Trail. And so basically, th these are some views from, uh, from Sunday morning and Saturday evening. So if you like the outdoors, um, this is a great part of the country to be. Um, so I would recommend, if you have the opportunity, uh, to come out and visit. Uh, we'd, be, we'd be glad to have you out here in Blacksburg. Um, and so basically, this is a, you know, a, a, a view of the university. Uh, we historically were a military college um, up until the early 70s. All of our students were required to be in the Corps of Cadets. And so the thing at the center of campus is called the drill field. And we still have a significant, significant uh, population of cadets on campus. My building is actually up in the corner here. And actually, in this picture, it hasn't yet been built. Um, so we're actually in a, in a newer building on campus. But despite the fact that we are in the south, uh, being in southwest Virginia, we are in the mountains. So we do actually get all four seasons, which uh, as a, uh, a Canadian by upbringing, I was happy to be able to have at least a little bit of winter time when I moved to Virginia Tech. Um, so a little bit about the department. I'm a, a faculty member in the Department of Chemical Engineering. We are a small department on campus. Um, you know, the mechanical engineering department and electrical engineering department here are, are very, very large. Uh, so we have about uh, 18 and a half faculty currently. We share one faculty member with the material science department and we graduate something on the order of about 100 seniors per year. That number fluctuates a little bit. Um, and generally, we have some, something on the order of 60 to 70 graduate students at any given time in the department. Um, so that's my, my uh, academic home. However, I'm also heavily involved with uh, the Macromolecules Innovation Institute, um, which is an interdisciplinary research institute focused on polymer science and engineering. Um, and so that has about 65 faculty from across 16 different departments. Um, basically has a lot of shared facilities, uh, materials characterization laboratory where they have different kinds of, of, of instruments that we can get access to, um, as well as running its own graduate macro degree program. So we actually have uh, macromolecular science and engineering PhD students who go from that, who go through that program in MII, uh, but then actually do their research with faculty in the various, the various home, home departments. All right, so that's, that's enough uh, advertisement. Um, we should probably get on with the technical part of the talk. Um, in terms of my background, I'm a chemical engineer by training. Uh, however, as an undergraduate, I had a minor essentially in material science. And then I went to the University of Minnesota, which is a combined chemical engineering and material science department. So everything that I do has a heavy materials component. Um, and so if I were to describe what, what we're interested in in my lab, we have sort of three pieces that I think come together. The one is um, looking at processing synthesis and self-assembly to a certain extent um, in terms of how do we actually make materials and how do we actually control uh, the properties of those materials that we make. Um, the next one is material structure, 
right? How do we control material structure? How do we measure material structure? And what impact does that have on the, the materials or devices that we're creating? And then finally, um, we're interested in molecular transport and interactions. And this is really where um, the, the work in membrane separations and some of our other separations kind of work comes in. So I'm not going to go through all of these in detail. Again, a large part of the work in our group currently is focused on membrane separations. And that's uh, some of that is water uh, desalination and wastewater treatment. Some of that is gas separations. Um, we also have some efforts in CO2 capture, basically looking at gas sorption. We actually have some interesting work looking at agricultural gases as well that we're, we're potentially getting into. Uh, we've done work in thin film morphology and adhesion. We did some work with ice adhesion and, and anti-ice adhesion coatings. We've done work in composites and nanocomposites, um, things like cellulose nanofiber composites and uh, composites containing carbon nanotubes. And then we did some work um, in morphology development. And I, I should update this because, again, the work in blockopolymers is something that's, that's a few years old now. We haven't, haven't focused on it recently. Um, but we're looking right now at expanding some of that work into uh, applications in additive manufacturing, so really understanding how morphology develops during the, the 3D printing process, um, especially for fused deposition modeling type 3D printing. But for today's talk, I'm going to focus entirely on this first uh, bullet point, right? Nanocomposite membranes for water purification. Um, and so I'm going to do what every other membrane talk has done now for at least the last year, um, probably longer than that. Uh, basically, there was a, an article that came out by David Scholl and Ryan Lively from Georgia Tech uh, back in April of 2016 uh, in, in, in Nature, Seven Chemical Separations to Change the World. And so Basically, everybody pulls this, this nice um, diagram from that paper to show you why we care about membranes. And so the idea here is that we have a total US energy cons consumption of 98 quads. Um, and now before I spent a year at the Department of Energy, I did not actually know what a quad was. Um, so a quad is short for uh, a quadrillion BTUs, where a BTU is a British thermal unit. Um, if we think about that in SI units, that's about 2.9 times 10 to the 13 kilowatt hours. Um, and so I was, I was doing some back of the envelope calculations on this. So the average American home consumes about 11,000 kilowatt hours per year. So this number here is equivalent to about 2.6 billion American homes. And that combines everything, right? So that's the residential power usage, commercial power usage, transportation, industrial power usage, et cetera. So for membrane applications, we're really interested in this industrial piece, which is 32% of the whole. And of that industrial piece, between 45 and 55%, so about half of that industrial energy usage is due to separation processes. Um, and so they kind of split these out into distillation, drying, and evaporation. So the thermal, uh, thermal separation processes, which we know are gonna be very high in energy because you have to come over, overcome latent heats of, very, of, of vaporization in order to affect those, those uh, separations. And so basically we see that we have about 16 quads of energy in separation um, and about eight quads of energy just in distillation. Um, and so the number that they bandy about is that if, if you could replace all of those distillation processes with something like membranes, which don't rely on a phase change to affect the separation, we could save 90% of that energy that we're spending on distillation which is about 7.2 quads, um, <clears throat> which comes out to about 7.3% of the total energy usage. And so if we think about, again, the total energy usage being 2.6 billion ohms worth of, of energy use, that 7.3% is about 191 million ohms worth of energy use. Um, and so that's why people care. That's why we think this is an interesting place to go. Um, now, Again, this is dealing with all different kinds of separations. Uh, many of these are not water. Um, in fact, in, in, in the case of water and desalination, um, we actually find that, that membranes have, have actually taken a much bigger role already. Um, so let's take a minute and think about what, what membranes are. Basically, what a membrane is, is a barrier, right? So we have some kind of material. I've got, I've got three different types of, of membranes depicted schematically here. Um, uh, it's basically a barrier where we have some mixture of uh, chemical compounds on one side um, and the goal of the membrane is to prevent or at least to uh, change the rate at which those different compounds move through this, this membrane barrier, right? So we have a difference in concentration between 
the upstream side and the downstream side. So if we look at this, this particular situation, we have these blue molecules and these orange molecules. And I've depicted three here. Two of these are porous membranes. Um, and one of them is a, a non-porous or solid membrane. And so if we, if we start over on the left, um, we can think about what's called a Knudsen diffusion separation method. And this is only, uh, only something that we would see in, gas, in the gas phase, right? Because it relies very low, um, very low gas densities in comparison to the width of, of these pores. But we do actually see this in certain kinds of inorganic membranes and carbon nanotubes and metals. Um, and so basically what you're relying on is a difference in the Knudsen diffusion constant uh, between these two molecules. Um, as we move further right, we actually decrease the size of those pores and we move away from, from a, a Newton diffusion mechanism, something we might refer to as molecular sieving. And so if we have a sieve, a sieve is just a, a, you know, a, a, a something that will allow, uh, allow a certain size particle through while preventing another, another particle size coming through. So again, we see these orange uh, particles that are much bigger than the blue ones. And so these pores will prevent passage of these orange particles through while allowing the blue particles to go through. And so again, we can see this um, in zeolites. We can see it in certain kinds of porous polymers. Um, and there are also metal oxide membranes that, that exhibit this kind of molecular sieving. The third case is the one that um, we may be most familiar with in terms of uh, the mechanism. And this is, this, these are, are, are dense solid membranes. Um, often these are polymeric. Um, and these use what we call a solution diffusion mechanism. And in the, in the solution diffusion mechanism, we have a combination of two effects. There's the effect of solubility and the effect of the diffusion constant. So as each of these molecules comes up to the surface, it has to partition, basically dissolve into the polymer membrane. Um, and they will do that at, at differing rates, right? So one molecule might have more affinity for the polymer. Um, also the size of, of the molecule has an impact on on how much can be dissolved into the, into the polymer membrane. And then there's a secondary effect of diffusion, right? And so generally, smaller molecules will diffuse at a faster rate through a membrane. Um, but again, there are, all, there are always um, exceptions to that rule based on specific intermolecular interactions. When we talk about desalination membranes, usually we, people, people talk about this from the perspective of molecular sieving, because what you're trying to do is, is effect a separation between a water molecule, which is small, and a hydrated salt ion, which tends to be larger. Um, however, there's, there's some question about you know, whether this is more of a solution diffusion mechanism or a molecular sieving, sieving mechanism. Um, when we talk about liquid phase separations from membranes, there are basically a, a hierarchy of different materials depending on the size of, of the things that we want to separate. And so if we think about the largest pore sizes on the order of 100 nanometers to 10 microns, this would be known as microfiltration. And so the things that would be rejected by our microfiltration membrane are fairly large, right? So we're talking about large scale colloids, uh, bacteria um, that are, are large enough to be rejected. As we get smaller, we get to ultrafiltration, which has pore sizes somewhere between two and 100 nanometers. And again, at that point, we can start rejecting smaller things like macromolecules um, and proteins, so biomacromolecules. Um, as we go to the next stage down, nanofiltration, now we're talking about things that are on the, the, the pore size on the order of a nanometer or so. Um, and so nanofiltration can affect some forms of desalination. So if you look in the literature, some desalination processes will refer to nanofiltration. That's really only good for multivalent salts, right? So where we talk about um, calcium, <clears throat> or sulfate type salts where you have larger, uh, larger cations and anions that are gonna have a much larger hydration radius. And then the final one, the one that we're gonna focus on is reverse osmosis. And so for reverse osmosis membranes, we're generally talking about pore size on, on the order of 0.1 to one nanometers. And as I mentioned before, once you get down to these small pore sizes, um, it is important to kind of ask whether we actually have a, 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 a molecular sieving type effect or whether this is more like a, a solution diffusion mechanism. Um, but the advantage of that is that we can now get down to the, the size scale where we can reject those monovalent salts, which make up the bulk of, of the salts that we see in say seawater or brackish surface water. Um, so again, depending on what we have, we're just rejecting smaller and smaller types of materials. Our interest is in the area of nanocomposite membranes. So instead of just using a, a pure polymer membrane, as, as might be commonly done for some of, these, some of these separations, we're interested in adding functionality or altering the, the performance of the membrane through the addition 
of, of nanoparticles. And I've basically split these up by geometry. So we can think about zero D nano, nanoparticles or zero dimensional nanoparticles, which are things like quantum dots, metallic nanoparticles. These are basically spherical or near spherical types of nanoparticles. We have one dimensional 1D nanoparticles, which are rods or rod-like in nature. And a lot of these are things like carbon nanotubes and, and other kinds of nanotubes like boron nitro nanotubes. Um, but another one of, of significant inter interest to us are these cellulose nanocrystals, which we'll talk about um, in some detail later on. Um, and then we can also think about two-dimensional nanoparticles. And these have gained a lot of interest uh, in the membrane area um, in the last 10, 15 years. Um, these go, down, go back to things like nanoclays. And obviously, people have looked at nanoclays for, for several decades. Um, but also uh, newer um, and more functional materials like graphene and graphene oxide. And again, whenever people are adding nanoparticles to these membranes, they are, they are trying to change the properties of the membrane. And so generally, we're talking about trying to do things like improve the flux, right? So improve the rate at which um, a material moves through the membrane. Um, improvements in selectivity, right? So Im improve the difference between the, the flux rates of different, different compounds. Uh, we want to be able to reduce fouling. So fouling is when we have buildup of some kind on the side of the membrane that will actually prevent the membrane from functioning properly. Um, that can be things like biofouling. So again, in a, in a desalination process, you're typically taking the, this water from the environment. There are lots, there's lots of stuff in that water, um, bacteria, viruses, um, other kinds of uh, biomacromolecules floating around that can stick to the membrane and prevent, prevent uh, effective functioning of the membrane. But this can also be things like uh, mineral scaling, right? Where again, we have um, sometimes have uh, divalent uh, salts, right? Especially calcium salts can cause this problem that actually precipitate out onto the membrane and can basically block the membrane. So, so reducing fouling is one of, the, one of the goals. And then the other thing that people will often talk about is um, their desire to improve the physical stability and robustness of the membrane. And so again, people have known for a long time that adding um, fillers to polymers can change the physical properties of those materials, right? Increase the strength, increase the modulus. So the focus for this talk is going to be on one-dimensional nanoparticles. Our interest is in these high aspect ratio one-dimensional nanoparticles. And so there are three that we're going to discuss. The first are, are carbon nanotube-based membranes. Then we'll talk about cellulose nanocrystals. And then finally, we'll discuss uh, metal organic framework-based high aspect ratio nanoparticle membranes. So desalination. Again, this is a uh, big business now. Water um, and the availability of clean water uh, has been identified by a variety of, of groups as one of the important challenges facing us globally in the 21st century. Um, and one of the solutions to uh, the availability of, of clean water is through desalination uh, and purification technologies. And so um, these numbers are a couple of years old. They're from 2018. Um, but at that point, there were almost 16,000 operational desalination plants globally uh, with a total desal desalination capacity of about 95 million meters cubed per day or 35 billion meters cubed per year, right? So this is a huge industry already. Um, and if we look at the share of different technologies that, that perform these, we see that by far the largest share, about 70%, is taken up by reverse osmosis, which is a membrane technology. If we look at the other, other pieces of the pie here, 18% is multi-stage flash, which again is a thermal evaporation process. Basically, we're just boiling off the water, leaving a, a brine behind. Um, we do have some other uh, membrane processes. Obviously, we have nanofiltration at about 3%. Again, that does not get your sodium chloride out of your water, right? So this is uh, very specific applications of desalination. Um, and then we have things like electrodialysis, which is also a membrane uh, process, but is, is very specific in, in its usage. But you can see that reverse osmosis is really the biggest piece of the pie. And then we look, look, when we look specifically at the type of waters that are being, um, being purified using these techniques, we see that seawater is still the biggest one, right? So 60% seawater, um, about 21% brackish water, which is basically lower salinity. Um, and then we have a few others, right? River water, pure water. And, and wastewater and brine. So what is desalination by reverse osmosis? So if you go back to your thermodynamics course, you'll remember that osmotic pr pressure is a thermodynamic quantity um, that is related to the uh, number density of objects in a solution. 
And so in the case of uh, salt water and fresh water, if we do the, the thought experiment where we have salt water on one side of a semi-permeable membrane and fresh water on the other side of that semi-permeable membrane, what we expect, again, if, if this membrane will allow water through, but will prevent the salt ions from, from uh, transiting the membrane, we expect that the fresh water will cross the membrane to dilute the salt water on the other side of the membrane. And it will do so until the osmotic pressure is equalized by a hydrostatic pressure. So we would expect that the height of the water on the salty side um, would increase until that hydrostatic pressure head would equalize. Um, so what is reverse osmosis? Reverse osmosis is a brute force approach to making this go the other way. So what we do is we apply enough pressure to the salt water side that we overcome that osmotic pressure and then drive the fresh water to the other side, right? So basically what we were doing is instead of diluting that salt water with fresh water, which is what would occur naturally, we're actually applying an external, an external pressure to that salt water side, driving water across the membrane so we get fresh water on the downstream side. And so basically what we have is a feed of, of seawater or brackish water, um, high salinity feed, goes through a high pressure pump, and this is where most of the energy goes into the process, significant amount of energy goes into that high pressure pump, um, and then we come into our membrane module. Uh, and so hopefully fresh water comes out as the permeate and concentrated brine comes out um, as the retentate from that membrane system. Um, and if we wanna think about how much energy we're talking about here, we can, we can look at membrane operating pressure um, as a way of thinking about how much energy goes into the process. So for brackish water, and again, all of the results that I will show for our work is done with brackish water, mainly because we don't wanna deal with really high pressure systems. Um, salinity on the order of about 2,000 ppm. And so the osmotic pressure there is about 31 psi. And so basically we have to put at least 31 psi um, on the upstream side of the membrane to get any water across. Generally what we're gonna do is then add a significant amount of extra pressure to try and get the water to flow through faster. So we operate on the order of you know, 200 psi or thereabouts. Seawater is significantly higher in terms of salinity. They're about on the order of 35,000. Again. This can vary depending on which uh, part of the world you're drawing your water from. Um, and so the osmotic pressure here is also much higher, right? Now 550 PSI, and so operating pressures can be as high as 800, um, even much higher, right? Up, up, up to 1200 or 1400 PSI. In terms of the separation itself, uh, we have water molecules, which have a, a diameter on the order of 2.8 angstroms, and then hydrated sodium and hydrated chloride, which both have uh, diameters on the order of, of seven um, angstroms. And so in theory, this is a relatively easy separation to do based on the difference in size. And so that's generally what people uh, assume the separation is controlled by. In terms of our characterization, we have a lab scale setup uh, to do these RO membrane experiments. I'm going to cover this now and just this is basically what we do for all of the different membranes we're going to look at. Uh, basically, we have a, a feed tank where we prepare our brine solution. We have our high pressure pump uh, that then feeds into our RO membrane cell. Um, inside the cell, we have our membrane, which we've, we've, we've put in there. Um, we have the feed. So basically, on the high pressure side, the feed comes in. There's a spacer, which serves to uh, increase turbulence in the flow across and prevent uh, concentration polarization and fouling of the membrane. Um, and then that comes out the outlet and then is basically recirculated back around into the feed tank, right? So we just basically recirculate our, our brine solution. Um, and then on the other side, we have a permeate stream, which hopefully is, is low salinity. And so we basically measure the quantity of the permeate that comes out with respect to time. And we use that to calculate our flux, right? So the flux Q will be equal to the uh, volumetric quantity of the permeate divided by the time divided by the area of the membrane. Uh, typically, this is reported in units of uh, LMH, which is liters per meter squared per hour. That's the standard for the RO membrane literature. Um, and then we'll take that sample and use atomic absorption spectroscopy to calculate the concentration of salt in both the feed material and in the permeate material. And from that, we'll calculate a rejection. And so rejection is a percentage value. It's defined as 1 minus the ratio of the concentration in the permeate divided by the concentration in the feed times 100. And so you can see that if we have 0% um, uh, rejection of the salt, then those concentrations will be the same and that value will go to zero. However, if we have 100% rejection, 
um, or if we have, we have no salt um, allowed to go through the membrane, we'll see that CP will go to zero and we'll get a value of 100. So the goal here is to get as close to 100% rejection as we can. Um, typically, again, we're doing brackish water conditions. So we're talking about 2000 ppm uh, feed. Um, we flow it through our membrane cell at about 2.5 liters per minute. And uh, most of the work is done here with a transmembrane pressure of 250, 250 PSI, or about 1.72 megapascals. Um, there is some data that'll show that it's at a slightly different, slightly different transmembrane pressure as well. So let's talk about the types of membranes that we're interested in. Um, <clears throat> so thin film composite reverse osmosis membranes have been state of the art in, in terms of uh, the, the industry standard since the late 70s, right? So the first, um, the first of, of these membranes were patented uh, back in the late 70s. What they consist of is, is multiple layers, right? So there's a, a non-woven support, typically a polyester, um, that is just there to provide uh, structural stability for the rest of the membrane. On top of that is a porous uh, polysulfone layer. And when I talk about porous, we're talking about small pores. So this is essentially an ultrafiltration membrane in its own right. And then on top of that ultrafiltration membrane, we will then deposit a very thin layer of polyamide. And this is the selective layer in terms of where the separation occurs between the water molecules and the salt ions. Um, that polyamide layer is typically deposited using an interfacial polymerization technique where we have uh, one monomer in aqueous solution that is, is basically laid down on the surface of that uh, polysulfone uh, ultrafiltra ultrafiltration membrane. And then uh, a second uh, monomer is then added on top of that in a hexane solution. And the, the polymerization occurs at the interface resulting in a very, very thin layer. Um, I have some images here that show what this looks like from the side. So here is some, uh, an SEM image of, of one of our membranes. Um, this actually contains some, some carbon nanotubes, but we can ignore those for, for the time being. Basically what we see is this porous polyether sulfone ultrafiltration membrane support. And then on top of that, we've laid down our polyamide layer. And what we see is that this polyamide layer is not very smooth at all. It actually has a very rough ridge and valley uh, type of structure. Um, and it has been suggested that that ridge and valley structure is actually very important in terms of increasing the amount of flux through, through the membranes. <clears throat> what I'm interested in are nanocomposite reverse osmosis membranes. And, and again, people have been looking at these for quite a long time as well. We can go all the way back in terms of carbon nanotube nanocomposites uh, to work that was done in the early 2000s. And so there's some really interesting work done by Bruce Hines at the University of Kentucky. Um, where they were growing vertical forests of carbon nanotubes and then infilling between them to create a very nicely well-ordered uh, material. Um, that's not actually what we're going to be doing because we're trying to create a more scalable type of, of process to produce the membranes. Um, in terms of RO membranes, as I mentioned, um, there are a variety of different kind of nanocomposites we can refer to. Uh, we have these surface located nanocomposites, basically where we're just embedding nanoparticles at the surface of a membrane to try and alter the surface properties. We have membranes where instead of embedding those nanoparticles in the active polyamide layer, we're actually embedding them in that polyether sulfone support. So we're basically modifying the ultrafiltration membrane lying underneath. Um, this is also the same as what they, this particular paper refers to as the conventional nanocomposite. What we're interested in is the thin film nanocomposite where we're actually embedding our nanoparticles inside this polyamide, thin polyamide layer at the surface of the membrane. And so there's been a variety of work done there um, using a variety of different nanoparticles, silver, silica, zeolite, et cetera. And even in the area of carbon nanotubes, there was, there was a variety of work. Um, we're actually interested in these vitrion uh, functionalized nanoparticles. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, they act as uh, gatekeepers for access to the interior of the carbon nanotube. And number two, um, it's been shown that when we add vitrion functional functionality to a membrane, we can actually increase the resistance to fouling that we might see in that membrane. So in terms of, our, our, of the work that we're interested in doing, we're adding these nanoparticles. Again, some of these we can see um, people have added nanoparticles to their membranes. These are gold, 10 nanometer gold nanoparticles that we can see built up in the membrane. And as I said, carbon nanotubes are the ones that we're gonna be focused on initially, but then we'll also talk about cellulose nanocrystals and metal organic frameworks. <clears throat> 
So why are we interested in carbon nanotubes? I mean, people have been interested in carbon nanotubes since they were discovered. One of the really interesting applications from a separation perspective is the idea that the carbon nanotubes, which are made up of these rolled up graphitic carbon sheets, have what has been referred to as unprecedented atomic smoothness. And so the idea is that if you can get a molecule inside that carbon nanotube, it can shoot down the interior of that tube with very little resistance. Um, and so the idea is that we might get one to five orders of magnitude of flow enhancement, right, compared to uh, a traditional no-slip flow prediction, uh, fluid dynamics kind of prediction. Um, there has been a variety of uh, molecular dynamics work done on these systems. I'm just going to show this one result by, by Corey from 2008 that specifically focuses on desalination. Um, and what he did was, was create a model um, and change the internal diameter of the carbon nanotubes, right? So we have diameters starting at about 11 angstroms going down to about 6.7 angstroms. Um, and as we move from larger diameter to smaller diameter, we see that our salt rejection increases, right? So our, our uh, 10.8 angstrom diameter has a salt rejection of 58%. Um, by the time we get to 8.1, we're at 100% salt rejection based on the, on the molecular dynamic simulations. At the same time, the flow rate in terms of how much water can travel through that membrane also decreases, but does not go to zero, right? So the idea is that if we could get uh, an 8.1 angstrom internal diameter carbon nanotube, um, then we could get, still have significant flow through that while still maintaining 100% salt rejection. And so that's kind of the goal um, in terms of making the membranes. So I mentioned that we weren't going to be making nicely vertically aligned forests of nanotubes. And again, there's a few reasons for that, right? We don't want to deal with a chemical vapor deposition process, right? Because that's kind of slow and, and, and expensive potentially. We're much more interested in uh, solution-based processes or suspension-based processes, which are similar to the, the methods that are currently being used to make um, RO membranes. And so that's what, what was originally developed for these carbon nanotubes. In terms of the materials that we're using, we're actually using a zwitterion functionalized carbon nanotube. So we have um, this amine-based uh, zwitterionic group that we add on. Um, it's fairly big, it's fairly bulky. The goal be behind adding these was to actually serve as, as uh, gatekeepers, either through charge repulsion or through steric hindrance. So the idea is that we have a, a, a nanotube that is, is too big, um, so it shouldn't have selectivity for, for the, the salt ions. And if we add this bulky group, the bulky group will allow the water molecules to go through, but through a combination of steric hindrance and charge repulsion will prevent our ions from traveling through the membrane. And so basically what we're doing is we're basically adding these severe ion functionalized carbon nanotubes into um, our membranes that we're producing using a traditional m diamine and trimethyl chloride to, to create um, a cross-linked network of polyamide. Um, in order to do this, we actually use what we call a, a vacuum filtration process. So we would start with our ultrafiltration uh, membrane where we have our polyether cell foam layer on our non-woven polyester. We would place that in uh, a vacuum filter, and then we would start with a dispersed solution of our zwitterionic single wall carbon nanotubes and actually vacuum filter that down onto the surface. So we end up with a mat of what we referred to as semi-aligned zwitterionic single wall nanotubes. The original idea was that we were going to be getting some kind of vertical alignment of those nanotubes due to the hydrodynamic forces present when we actually vacuum filter these things down. Um, I'm not actually convinced that we have as much alignment as we would like. Um, so we've, I've tended away from using that semi-aligned uh, term, terminology um, as we move forward. Once we have that in place, we then put our, our amine solution, so it's, it's water containing m diamine on the surface. Um, we then basically roll that off so we just have a thin layer left, and then we add a solution of trimethyl chloride and hexane to the surface and, and, and we get our interfacial polymerization. And the idea is that we are now embedding these carbon nanotubes inside that interfacially polymerized polyamide layer. And so this is what it looks like at the end. Again, the nice thing about carbon nanotubes, you start with a nice white um, ultrafiltration membrane support, and then we see a, a nice black membrane where we put down our carbon nanotubes. So that's the advantage of using the carbon nanotubes. You actually see where they are when you put them down. So when we, uh, we made these membranes and we, we played around with a variety of different things, I'm not gonna go into all, the, all of the detail. Um, basically, if we look at it, we can see there are some differences in the way the membranes look. So this is the polyether cell phone support before we do any kind of uh, membrane preparation. 
If we do a pure polyamide membrane without any added carbon nanotube, this is what we see. And this is, again, the, the normal ridge and valley structure that we would expect to see in a polyamide membrane. And we do see a significant change in the morphology of that surface when we add these carbon nanotubes. So we, so we know that those carbon nanotubes are having a significant impact on the morphology and structure of the membrane. Um, and then if we look at this uh, freeze fracture SEM image, we can actually see um, <clears throat> what look to be bundles of carbon nanotubes. Um, they're not single nanotubes because we wouldn't expect to see those in an SEM image, but we do, do expect to see bundles of carbon nanotubes that are kind of embedded in that membrane. More importantly, we do see a significant impact on membrane performance. And so what I have here um, on this plot, on the left, we have the permeation flux, again, in liters per meter squared per hour. On the right, I have percent rejection. And I'll point out this goes from 90 to 100%, not 0 to 100%. So even these things that are low are still at about 93% rejection. Um, and so we have a plain polyamide membrane as our control. And then we have two membranes here where we are increasing the quantity of very unfunctionalized single wall nanotubes, so 9% and 20%. And the key thing to note is that the, the permeation flux in gray increases from 11.6 to 23.9 and then all the way up to 48.6. So we're seeing more than a fourfold increase in water flux. And these are all done at the same transmembrane pressure. Um, at the same time, we are seeing, uh, seeing that we are maintaining or even increasing uh, the salt rejection, again, from a 97% to 98.5 and 98.6%. So we see that by adding uh, these vitrion functionalized uh, carbon nanotubes, we see a significant improvement in performance over our control, which was the plain polyamide membrane. The other interesting thing, and again, I mentioned uh, anti-biofouling. We did some work uh, using bovine serum albumin um, and basically tuning our uh, solution so that we would have the most amount of BSA absorbed on a surface over time. So this just shows different conditions where we were looking at how much BSA to have in and, and, and what the ionic strength of the solution would be. And so we did some studies where we had one gram per liter BSA with an ionic strength of 10 millimolar. Um, and we see a significant decrease in the flux as a function of time. And so if we look over here on the right, we have uh, a normalized flux. So we start out with a flux of 1.0. We have two different membranes. We have the plain polyamide membrane in purple and our zvitorion carbon nanotube functionalized polyamide membrane in red. And so what we see is that over time, we see a decrease in the performance of both of these membranes. And that's due to the buildup of this protein on the surface of the membrane. Right? The, the, the protein is, is adhering to the membrane, basically inhibiting the flux of water through that membrane. Um, and so we see a couple of things that we can take away from this. Number one, we see a much more significant drop in the plain polyamide membrane than we do in the membrane con containing our functionalized carbon nanotubes. Um, the other thing to note, is that when we do a water flush, right, water cleaning step, while our polyamide membrane only you know, regains a small amount of its original flux, our uh, carbon nanotube membrane basically sees a full, full recovery of the flux. And so again, the presence of that zvitorion functionality in those carbon nanotubes is helping to prevent adhesion of these proteins on the surface. So we are seeing a significant impact on antibiofouling in these kinds of systems. Um, <clears throat> All right, so there's another piece of this. This is the same plot that I showed you before, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this last piece of data. So the first three pieces of data is plain polyamide and then the zvitorion functionalized carbon nanotubes. Um, the last piece of data is what we call an end-capped carbon nanotube. And so this is basically, as part of the, the synthesis process, we would take end-capped carbon nanotubes, which basically have a cap over the end. So these are not open tubes. Um, and we would have to open those up using an acid uh, hydrolysis step. We'd end up with hydroxyl, hydroxyl groups decorating the ends of those carbon nanotubes, and then we do the chemistry on those hydroxyl groups, add this vitrion. Um, but as another control, we decided to look at the end-capped materials. Um, and so adding the same amount as this vitrion, we actually saw the same increase in water flux, right? So we're going from 11.6% to 48.6% uh, for the, the vitrion functionalized nanotubes and 11.6% or 11.6 LMH to 49 LMH for the end cap tubes. Now we do see a significant decrease in the uh, salt rejection, right down to 93%. Um, but the whole point of adding a carbon nanotube is that we are seeing transport through the tube. Um, and this 
particular uh, piece of data got us to thinking a little bit about what was actually going on inside the membrane. And so we can think about a few different possible paths for transport in the membrane. Um, and so if we think about our, whatever our molecule is, I say our water molecule, um, it has three different choices, right? One, one of those choices is if it finds the end of the, of, of the nanotube, it can basically transport down the nanotube. And this is essentially what we were assuming would happen. Um, it always has the, op the option of just going through the polymer, right? So we can, we can always have transport through the polyamide membrane. But there is a third potential pathway, and that pathway involves running down the outside of those carbon nanotubes. Um, and so what it, it occurred to us, because we're not aligning these, where these are not vertically aligned forests of nanotubes. Um, so the thought is that basically we actually have things running through this nanochannel rather than running through the center of the carbon nanotube. And we're seeing an impact due to the presence of these nanochannels. And if that's true, then we don't need to actually have a tube at all. All we need is a high aspect ratio nanoparticle. Um, because in, in, in our cases, we have to think about how likely it is, is it that a water molecule is finding the open end of that nanotube. It's much more likely for a, a water molecule to run into the side of one of these nanotubes and run down the side. So this brings us to our next filler, and that's nanocellulose. Um, and there's a few reasons why we chose nanocellulose. We have some good reasons here, things like it's abundant, it's renewable, they're low cost. We have unique, these unique high aspect ratio morphologies, availability, sustainability. But really what it comes down to is that um, when we were started, starting to do this group, uh, Johan Foster, a professor in uh, material science, was kind of just across campus, and I could call him up and say, hey, do you have any cellulose nanocrystals? Okay, and so basically we got these, these materials from him. And again, cellulose nanocrystals, again, they come from uh, a variety of sources. Most of them come from, from wood. Um, depending on the source, you actually get differences in how long those nanoparticles are versus the diameter. Um, and so we have a little bit of some games we can play with what exactly the aspect ratio is. The other thing about them is that they are relatively easy to functionalize. And one of the classic ways to do that is to do what's called a tempo oxidation. Um, and so tempo basically goes from we go from having a bunch of hydroxyl groups and some sulfate esters on the surface, um, and we convert all those hydroxyl groups to carboxylic acid groups. Um, and so that's one of the main, the main things that we've done. And, and the data that I, I will show you will be for tempo oxidized CNC molecule, or CNC uh, nanoparticles. So we decided we would try these out, and we do exactly the same method that we used for the carbon nanotubes in that we would start with our uh, PES layer, um, and then we would do a vacuum filtration step and we'd get these hopefully semi-aligned uh, tempo oxidized cell, uh, cellulose nanocrystals on the surface. And then we would do our uh, interfacial polymerization and get our nice polyamide membrane with embedded uh, nanocrystals. And so we did that and we got some data and the data was terrible, right? So if you, if you look at the data, we have salt rejection on the left, we have flux on the right. I'm not sure why my student decided to switch up the order of those. Um, but basically, the salt rejection data is this light blue data. Uh, for the plain polyamide membrane, we have very good salt rejection. This, this is close to 99%. And then as we add our tempo oxidized cellulose nanocrystals, we see that uh, rejection is decreasing. Um, however, we don't see a, a, an increase in flux, which is what we would expect. We would expect that adding these, uh, these nanocrystals would provide new, func new avenues for transport through the membrane. Um, that's just not what happened. We got very inconsistent results. Um, and so it occurred to us that what we should do would be to look at um, what these things looked like before we did the interfacial polymerization. So we could get an idea of what the structure of this kind of mat of cellulose nanocrystals looked like. And so we did some AFM. And so this is AFM looking at um, the cellulose nanocrystals on the ultrafiltration support before we do uh, any significant amount of, uh, of, of, of polymerization. What we find out is that these things form very, very nice solid mats of nanocellulose, which is not what we wanted at all. What we were looking for was something where we had these things dispersed in the solution. And so we had to come up with a new way to do it. And we came, what we did was, is, is very common in the nanoparticle literature. It's called a dispersion method. Basically, we disperse the nanoparticles in one of our two solutions, right? And then we do our interfacial polymerization to get our nice membrane. And when we do that, we get much more consistent results. So here we can see we're maintaining high salt rejection. And as we increase in the amount of tempo oxidized cellulose nanocrystals, we see that we're actually increasing the amount of flux, right, in, in kind of a, a relatively controllable fashion. 
And so again, what we've done here is we've added these new transport pathways within the membrane um, to allow us to alter the flux while maintaining selectivity. And we think there's a lot more opportunity for actually controlling what goes on at that surface. Um, so we can actually really tune the interaction between the polyamid and these nanoparticles to control that, that transport at the surface. So again, these things, these, these tempo oxidized scenes, these really saw a, a good impact. Um, and again, the, the, the mechanism that we propose is due to these nanoscale voids at the surface. The other thing I wanted to talk about briefly, I think I have a couple of minutes just to finish up, is has to do with metal organic frameworks. And metal organic frameworks are kind of interesting because those potentially offer us um, access to internal pores without having to find the end of a nanotube. And so metal organic frameworks, if you're not familiar with them, are, are basically coordination polymers. So we have organic ligands that uh, coordinate with, with metal centers. And they form some very nice different kinds of structures. Um, we have things that form uh, hexagonal tubes and other kinds of things. We can have one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional structures. Uh, the really interesting thing for, about this came, though, when my colleague in chemistry, Amanda Morris, suggested to me, she says, well, I can make MOFs in terms in, as, as nanorods. I said, well, that fits with what we're, we're really interested in. And so what she did in her group, they came up with a, a material PCN-222, which is a known metal organic framework material. Um, and based on changing the synthesis properties, we could actually alter the morphology of these. And so we could create these more rod-like structures. The problem with these is that they have fairly large pores, right? 37 angstrom pores. And so what we wanted to do was use post-synthetic modification to actually tune the size of those pores. And so again, the idea here is now we have rods of MOFs and we have some combination of materials going outside the MOF as well as going through the MOF. And so again, the problem here is the size of this pore, 37 angstroms is far too big to be selective, right? So we can fit a lot of water molecules in there. Um, equally, we can fit a lot of sodium ions in there, right? So that should not be selective at all. What we do is we add myristic acid. Myristic acid goes in there and actually uh, binds to these metal centers. Um, and basically limits the amount of free volume inside the pore to a much smaller area. Uh, once we've done that, again, hopefully if we do it right, the water molecules will still go through while sodium molecules will be rejected. And so we do the same kind of uh, uh, production method where we disperse these nanorods in one of our solutions and do our, our interfacial polymerization. And what we saw was kind of interesting. So these are all done for the same loading level, so the, so the same amount of nanoparticle. However, what we've done is change the amount of myristic acid inside the MOF. And so we can see as we change the amount of myristic acid, the flux actually increases as we increase the amount of myristic acid. Um, we saw some somewhat inconsistent results in terms of uh, the, the salt rejection. And I think the reason for that has to do with aggregation. Um, but the, the really interesting part was that we didn't see the, the behavior that was expected for the fully open. We expected when we added um, these nanoparticles with no added myristic acid that we would see zero rejection, but we still saw 95% salt rejection here. And the thought is that we actually have polymerization of that polyamide occurring inside the metal organic framework pores. Um, then once we add the myristic acid, we're actually preventing that polymerization from occurring. And then eventually, if we add enough myristic acid, we're actually changing from basically a hydrophobic pore a hydrophilic pore, and that's changing the uh, behavior of the, the transport in the membrane. Um, again, aggregation is a big problem here, so we see fairly large aggregates. I and mean, then again, as we add these myristic acid components, these basically make these uh, PCN-222 nanorods more hydrophobic, and so they don't disperse as well in aqueous solution. And so that's a problem that we're still uh, working to overcome right now. Um, I'm going to skip through this quickly and just get to the end. I think I've, I've talked enough. Um, so we have PCN-222 nanorods that offer kind of a really interesting tunable thin film nanocomposite additive. Um, and again, we see up to a 95% flux increase and 96% salt rejection. And again, now we have, we've added even more transport pathways, right? Both pore transport within the MOF, as well as the potential for nanochannels at the interface. Um, but again, these aggregates really do require significant further study. And so just to get back again, um, we've done work with carbon nanotubes. Tubes. We've done work with CNCs and we've done work with MOF nanorods. Um, they all offer some really interesting options for tuning and altering the transport properties in these, in these membranes. Um, so we've seen some good results, uh, both from the carbon nanotubes and, and some of the other materials. 
but significant amounts of work are really needed still to understand, especially to understand the, the actual mechanism of what's going on inside the membrane. And so with that, I'm going to conclude. Um, oh, I didn't realize I had this in here. Let's get through that. And just acknowledge a few people quickly. Uh, Connor Farrell um, is currently working on, on this project with Brittany Bonnet from the chemistry department. A lot of the work was done by Ethan Smith, who just graduated in the spring. He's now a, an employee at Integris up in Boston. Um, and Dr. Keith Hendren from Material Science did a lot of the, the synthesis work for the cellulose nanocrystals. And he's um, now at Luna Innovations, um, or sorry, right, yeah, he, that's right, Luna Innovations in Blacksburg. Um, Dr. Wifong Chan, who graduated uh, several years ago and is now at Intel, did a lot of the work on the carbon nanotubes. So I wanna, wanna emphasize that they did the work, not me. And then also thank my uh, collaborators, Amanda Morris and Eve Moran, and uh, Johan Foster should be on here as well. So with that, I'm gonna conclude. Um, and again, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you very much, Steve. Um, so now the floor is gonna be open to questions. Like I said, if you have questions and you wanna put them in the chat, that's fine. Otherwise you can unmute yourself and ask Steve questions directly. So we do have one question already. From Ahmed Jassim, and the question is: Have the Laplace pressures been considered inside the CNGs due to the capillary buildup? I would expect there is a significant pressure. Um, so that's an interesting question that I probably don't have have the answer to. Um, I would have to go back and look at the uh, look at the original papers doing the modeling. It's certainly not something we considered. Um, so. Yeah, they, I, I actually don't have a good answer for that. Let's see here from Luke. After the water cleaning step, was the same sodium percent rejection obtained? Yeah, so um, what we would, you're talking for the anti-biofouling kind of work? Um, I think so, yes. Yeah, so, so in that case, um, go back to that real quick. So in that case, yes, um, we didn't report we didn't report the the salt rejections here. But if anything, what you see when you get that buildup is actually you see an increase in salt rejection. Um, and so yeah, basically once once we did the cleaning, we we got got back to the same salt rejection that we had before. I guess I had a question uh, about the MOFs part of this. So it's been a while since I've worked with MOFs related literature, but it used to be that, you know, if you breathed on them the wrong way, they'd all fall apart. Are there stability issues with these or is it like, is it limited to a specific application where they're stable or mm -hmm. what, what's the, what's the- Yeah, word? so that's, that's, that is a, a really good question. And it's one that always comes up. And the answer is it really depends on the moth. So um, these ones are stable under a number of conditions. One of the concerns um, that has been reported before with moths in the interfacially polymerized membranes was that the MOFs were actually dissolving. Uh, one of the byproducts of that interfacial polymerization is a small amount of hydrochloric acid. Um, so the idea was that you had this HCl in there that was, was basically dissolving these MOF particles. Um, we have not observed that. Uh, we've done a lot of testing with the PCN222 under different conditions. Um, boiling and nitric acid, you know, all kinds of stuff. So, so the answer is Yes, some MOFs are very sensitive, but there are, there are a number of MOFs nowadays that have significantly better stability under different conditions. Um, we do note that those particular MOFs, if we let them sit right, in aqueous solution for too long, they change color. Um, and that suggests to me a structural change <laughs> right, is going on. Um, so we, didn't, we, we made sure that we would use them within a reasonable amount of time. We haven't done long-term stability studies. Because um, our, our goal here was just proof of concept. So it's not meant to be a, a, an optimized system. Thank you. Um, if the CNTs are coated by a hydrophobic fluffy TiO2, will that be good in the same scenario, of, in the scenario of using CNTs semi-aligned? So aligned versus un unaligned. So that's... Um, so that's an interesting question. Yeah, th this question of alignment is important. And um, I mentioned before, so the reason that I went away from talking about semi-aligned stuff was number one, I didn't think we were getting that from our technique. And um, when we looked at CNCs with that vacuum filtration technique, we got the opposite of what we want, right? So you start out, you want things vertically aligned. 
But with the CNC's, we're getting things horizontally aligned. CN, the, the carbon nanotubes are a little bit different because they're longer and they're floppier. Um, and so I, what I often describe to people is that what we have there is kind of like a plate of spaghetti, right? So you, you basically filter these things down and you end up with this kind of like woven, interwoven kind of mat of, of carbon nanotubes. Um, I'm happy with a haystack. That's kind of my idea, right? I don't need them all vertical as long as on average, right, there is some verticality to it. I don't want them all horizontal. Um, and we can do that better with carbon nanotubes and CNCs than we could say with graphene. I mean, one of the problems with these 2D things is that they really want to align flat. Um, I don't know about adding something like a fluffy TiO2. Um, one of the challenges with, with TiO2, if it's hydrophobic, again, is that um, one of the solutions that we use is in water. Um, and so if you put down a hydrophobic thing on the surface, if we vacuum filter that down on the surface, and then we put, try and put our, our water solution on top of that, we might not actually get good um, coverage of the MPD, aqueous MPD solution. Um, and so there, it, it's, some of this membrane stuff is a little bit like black magic. You have to do it exactly right. Um, and adhesion with the surface could be a significant, significant issue. Now you could potentially disperse those in the hexane phase, right? If they're hydrophobic, they should disperse in hexane okay. Um, and what you'd end up then with is, is to have those, those molecules more in sort of the upper, you know, the upper level of the interfacially polymerized mem membrane and maybe more exposed at the surface. Does that, does that answer the question? I, I think it does. Yes, it does. Cool. All right, so folks, we've reached the top of the hour. And let's see here, we'll have one more question here before we have to call it quit. So let's see from Luke, have you considered coding the larger pore with material other than myristic acid, I see. I imagine you could tune to hydrophobicity with hydrocarbon, tangling saturation, or even trying something akin to a triglycerol. Yeah, so that, that is exactly what we would like to do next. Um, and this is, comes down to this question, well, why did you use myristic acid? And the answer is, I think that's what Brittany had in the lab. So she was like, oh, I'm gonna put myristic acid in. So we didn't do a lot of, didn't have a lot of like specific thought about like what carbon length or what functionality. So yeah, in, in theory, we can do this, it's called the solvent assisted ligand intercalation or insertion. We can do this with a whole variety of different materials. And so the tunability is potentially significant. We just haven't done a lot of that, done a lot of that work yet. But yeah, adding something that is more hydrophilic would certainly help with dispersion. Um, and so we might be able to get those MOFs better dispersed in, in, the, uh, in the membrane and, and hopefully maybe get a little bit more consistency in terms of some of the results, especially at high loading, high loading content. All right, sounds good. Well, let's thank Steve once again for your, your time and effort, and then especially with this virtual environment, we really appreciate you taking the opportunity to speak to all of us. And for everyone out there, we look forward to seeing you next week. So I think that's our next seminar is coming up next week. So we look forward to seeing you then. Everyone have a great afternoon. Matthias, if you wanna close off, close us out with anything. Yep, you did, you did perfect, Reg, thank you. Next week's speaker will be Al Weimer from the University of Colorado. Uh, same time, same place, 11 a.m. on Tuesday on Zoom. Um, we'll send out another invite for that talk, separate link. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Thank you very much. Nice to talk to you all. Thanks, Steve.